Hey, let's talk a little bit about a build tool called Parcel.js. If you're new to web development or you're not even into web development, as a web developer, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen in between your source code and getting it ready for the web. You have to minify assets and uglify assets. You may have to transpile, say, ES6 JavaScript down to JavaScript the browsers you support understand. You might have to transpile your CSS down to CSS your browsers you support will understand. If you're doing something like React or Preact or Vue, you might have to transform those components uh, into something the browser will understand. So there's a lot that needs to go on. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's it's the best of times and the worst of times. It's the best of times in that the things you, we can do in a web browser today are incredible. It's the worst of times in that doing incredible things is complicated sometimes, especially for the maker. You know, I've always been really fascinated by build tools. Lately, I've been using Brunch. I started out with Grunt, which nobody uses Grunt anymore. And then I went to Gulp which not a whole lot of people use that anymore either. And then I went to NPM scripts, then I tried Webpack and I ran away screaming. And then I, lately I've been doing things with Brunch. Brunch is really cool. It's a build tool with all kinds of extensions for it to do anything you can think of, from PWA stuff to image minification to anything you want to do. I've been using that a lot, but I do a lot of stuff in Vue.js, and the Vue.js plugin for Brunch is not in great shape. It's uh, the ownership of that plugin has has changed hands a few times, and there are things you have to do to use it that if, eh, they don't feel great. And there are some bugs in it where, like, instead of importing JavaScript files in the your view components themselves, you have to do it up in the main JS and in the view component, which is weird. It's not the greatest for view development. For React and Preact and, and other stuff, it's it's just fine. But for view, it's a little rough. So I've been looking around at other stuff. I tried out Webpack again. I try out Webpack every six months, and then I run away. Webpack, you should try Webpack because it is the it is the king of the hill right now and has been for a while and lots of people really like it so when i say i run away screaming go try it yourself you might think it's the greatest thing in the world i'm probably totally wrong but it just drives me a little whenever i see just import your css into your javascript I, what why would anyone do uh it just drives me a little nuts. I think the biggest problem is it's a single entry point type of builder, uh, whereas Brunches say watches a folder for for all kinds of stuff, which is has its pluses and minuses. Uh, Webpack is a single entry point, and the entry point they picked is a JavaScript file, and that's really the wrong thing to pick for a web app. Your entry point is your HTML. And that's what loads your JavaScript and your CSS and your images and everything else. I understand why you might not want to pick that. HTML can be just a screaming mess, and that can really throw off your your watcher, your your, your build tool. Be much easier to watch JavaScript, where the errors are much more clearly errors. He said, not totally sarcastically. Uh, I think they picked the wrong thing, and it. it I see, like I go, let's do the sample view app and see what the webpack script looks like. It's like 50 lines of this giant, yeah, not my favorite thing, but you should try it. Don't take my word for it. You try it. Then I try Neutrino. Neutrino is supposed to be like a zero configuration uh, middleware to sit on top of webpack, which I thought, yeah, it sounds neat. And I tried it, and it's not really my bag either. I tried their default view app, and the problem is, again, it's an entry point issue because it's using Webpack, but they treat their default view thing 
to where there's there's no HTML whatsoever. It wants to make the whole HTML page for you and it expects your view to handle everything inside the body tags. And that's just not the way I develop apps. I, I think you make a good argument that's not how anyone should develop apps. That these uh, reactive component frameworks are come with an ex a cost and just for doing silly stuff in your web page you don't want to pay that cost for some of that so again not really my back i did find out there's a way to make your own html template instead of the one they use but it's still kind of eh, nah, funky and that gets us to parcel js went all around the world and here, here we are back here again parcel js is a competitor to webpack it's very new it's very clean code. It's extremely fast. It's over twice as fast as Webpack on this one person's MacBook Pro for this one project. Your, your mileage might vary. But it's fast. It has a live reload server. And it's a zero configuration tool. It does your Babel stuff for JavaScript transformation. It does your post CSS stuff. You can get it to do uh, SAS or whatever as well. Uh, it's really pretty cool. Let's take a look at how this works. I should say before I start, I borrowed some code and some pointers from a couple articles on Alligator IO, building Vue.js apps with Parcel and building your web app using Parcel. So I'll link to those in the show notes. They were very helpful. Thank you, Alligator.io. And we're over here in Visual Studio Code. I find it's a little easier than using Vim when I'm jumping around a lot of places and showing people stuff. So, what do we got? What does our package JSON look like to build a view app with uh, post-CSS and ES6 and all that kind of stuff? Uglification, minification. This is it. This is the entire thing. We're looking at five dependencies. We're getting our parcel bundler, which is parcel JS. We're getting a preset for it for view. We also have presets for React and, and so forth. We're getting an extra post CSS uh, plugin, CSS Next. I like to use it, but you don't have to. And the Babel preset for ENV. Uh, this is what you should be using if you're using Babel now. Uh, it's kind of like auto prefixer for Babel. You tell it what browsers you want to support and that's all the transformation it does. It doesn't do everything by default. But that's it. Let's let's go ahead and just put some of this stuff in here. We'll put in uh, parcel bundler. And that's what's is what runs everything. If you're just doing a web app and you don't want to do any kind of stuff like a reactive framework craziness, or and you don't have any extra plugins you want for say Babel or post CSS, you're done. You just need that one component and it will run everything for you. But we want to do more stuff. So let's put in uh, Let's put in parcel plugin view. I can type and view. That'll get us our view stuff. Then let's put in our Babel preset and our CSS next. That'll get us everything we need and more. And off it goes. Ah. Oh, aren't you jealous? Look at my web connection. It's not Google. It's not Google Internet, but it's not bad. We've got all of our stuff now. What they say in some of the tutorials for Parcel.js is to install a Parcel bundler, bundler globally. I don't like to... I like to avoid installing anything globally in Node. I like to install it locally and then use a script in the package.json. So I say start in Parcel. You can install Parcel globally and you wouldn't have to run it through Yarn or NPM, but you can just install it locally and then not have to worry about 
anything to do with Stalin globally. All right, just so you can see what the arguments for parcel are, uh, I just put in a little parcel help here. So you can change the port, change the HTTPS, which is very handy. Uh, open your web browser, specify a different output directory by default at the start, goes to dist. It does hot module replacement, you can turn that off. It does a file system cache, which you'll see, which you can also turn off. And that's about it, does about everything you wanna do. When you run parcel, by default, you just point it to your entry point, and here's our index.html. So, so you yarn start. It's gonna build all of our stuff. And over here, we have the greatest app ever written. All this is doing, this massive index.html is loading a CSS file and a JavaScript file and it's loading a div with an ID of app. The CSS is loading, doing an import for another CSS and uh, parcel handles all that, all that uh, importing so it goes into one file. It's using a JavaScript variable here, or, or sorry, a, a CSS variable. And not much else to say, but it's importing this other button CSS which actually isn't doing anything. And the JavaScript is importing view and our view component and rendering that. And our view component is importing another module, just so I can confirm that it actually does that correctly. And it's just drawing this text in a random color. We can change this text and save and it'll rebuild and you can see it's it's a live hot module replacement live reload kind of thing. That's it, we're off and running. We look over at our distribution directory where it's putting this stuff. You see by these long file names, this is what it means by uh, cache. If you look in your index.html, it's pointing, repointing to these names and this is to bust your cache. So if you have JavaScript set to cache for like a month, but your index.html really shouldn't be cached unless you're caching it for like five seconds or something really small, it'll be pointing a totally different file and that busts your cache and then, then you're good to go. So you don't have the, the dreaded phone call where clean your cache, clear your cache, because you know, that happens a lot. So it made our stuff, you notice that it breaks the JavaScript out into a uh, out into a vendor bundle, which is including view and all that kind of stuff, and our uh, just our code. Which is nice. If you have more than one one page or something, you can share a, a view the vendor bundle and, and, and things of that nature. You notice also that image, this uh, cat here. It detected that image in our CSS file, and it just outputs it here. A, a couple of things I, well, one thing I, I don't like is it kind of just dumps it all. I have stuff in my build, my build directory in nice, neat little folders. Uh, it just kind of dumps it all in, in the root directory there. So if you're a neat freak on what goes out to production, it's, it's not the greatest. But really what goes out to production uh, kind of doesn't matter in terms of neatness. It just needs to work. The other thing to note is it does not do image minification, and I can't find any plugin for Parcel that will do image minification. And that was a bummer, but I thought about it. It really makes sense to do your image minification as you add images to your project and not at build time because it slows down build time and you really only ever need to run that once. Instead, you're running it every time you build and it's, it just seems unnecessary. So I kind of get why they didn't put image minification in there. Plus it can be a pain because it's gonna build some C stuff usually depending on your image minification and a lot of people on Windows don't have a C compiler by default and it can be a real pain in the butt. So I get why they didn't, but it doesn't do image minification. 
But that is Parcel JS. Hey, let's do run a full build, which will do minification. You notice if you look at like the CSS now, it's it's uh, not minified. You will notice it changed that variable over. It handled all that processing. That was our CSS next uh, module. In our package, JSON, we specified our build step, and it's just parcel build in that same entry point. Mm, oh, we don't want to run that. Run, yarn run build. Now if it's going to go. Yep, yep, yep. And giving you a bunch of notes. I uh, uh, declarations and unreachable. Uh, uh, I don't even know what all this crap is, but I'm sure it's important to someone. So that that minified all of our stuff. So if we look at our CSS file again, and this is confirming to me that that's that's a hash because it didn't change the name. You can see it is all minified for us. And the same thing, JavaScript will be uglified and so forth. So now you're ready to deploy. Now, how you tell Parcel to use different uh, plugins for Babel or PostCSS is in your main folder, you'll put in a Babel RC and you give it the presets. Here we're just doing ENV. And we have a .postCSS RC and we're giving it CSS next. You don't need to do CSS Nano. That's CSS notification is just built in. And I also have in here a dot browser list RC, and that's how you can tell things like ENV and auto prefixer what browsers you're going to support. Last two versions is actually the default, so I don't even need this here, but I just have it there for clarifications. You can have a line above that that's like greater than 1% if you want to catch those browsers, or give me Safari 7 and higher because no one updates their iPads anymore. You can do all that kind of stuff in that file. That is Parcel.js. I like it quite a bit. It, uh, especially for Vue, it seems to do everything uh, just right. So for my next project, I will, I'm going to try this sucker out. And if anything explodes and makes you tear my hair out, I'll, I'll post an update. Uh, but so far, I like it. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.